Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Today we have a very interesting video. A video that I went into researching thinking it was all a bunch of nonsense. And I found out some interesting things that I want to share with you today. We're talking about Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. But before we get into the video, I want to talk to you about my sponsor, Audible. Audible is an amazing service that gives you access to thousands of audiobooks. Using Audible has been imperative in my research process because I don't have a lot of time to sit down and physically read a book. I'm on the go, I've got kids, I've got a, a YouTube channel, I've got a lot of things going on, so there's not a lot of time like there used to be in the old days where I can sit down and just crack open a book. But Audible gives me all my favorite books, including books I need for research in audio form. I really found in the past couple of years that I've really turned to sources for research or knowledge that are audio based or documentaries that I can listen to and still get a lot out of instead of having to sit down and watch the whole thing because we're all busy people. We all have a lot of stuff going on. We have school, we have work, we're driving the kids to karate or soccer or gymnastics. We have dishes to wash and laundry to do. We have floors to clean. We've got toilets to scrub. Oh, it's my favorite part. But what I'm saying is we're on the go and we need a way to get our knowledge and entertainment in without having to necessarily sit down and watch something for two or three hours. That's why I really love Audible and I really love Magellan TV for that too because the documentaries on Magellan TV are so thorough that you really don't need to watch all the time. You can actually just listen and go about your day. And Audible is the same way. Actually, I used a book from Audible to do a lot of research for the case that we're talking about today. So if you find yourself watching this video and enjoying it and wanting to know more, you can go ahead and download Audible and use your free one month trial to download the book Hunt for the Skinwalker by Colm Kelleher PhD. This book will keep you on the edge of your seat for the entire time that you're listening to it. I promise. And it's legitimately the perfect book to listen to during the Halloween season. I mean Halloween season. Either way, it's going to be perfect. So go ahead and go in the description box, click on that link and start your one month free trial with Audible. Let's get started on the video. So like I said, when I first heard about this, and this was highly requested months ago when I went into the community tab on my page and asked you guys, what do you want to see videos on during Halloween? So many of you came back with Skinwalker Ranch. And I'm like, okay, let me look into this and see if there's anything here. And I went into it thinking, there's nothing there. This is just a folk tale or a fairy tale or just a scary thing that people tell other people to scare them. But when I was doing my research, I had a hard time determining what was real and what wasn't. We know that Skinwalker Ranch is a real place. We also know that Skinwalker Ranch and its surrounding area, the Unita Basin, have had many, many sightings of mysterious things happening over the past several years. Not just from one person, not just from a handful of people. So first, let's start off with an explanation of what a Skinwalker is. A skinwalker is a person with the ability to transform into any type of animal at will, usually taking the form of coyotes, wolves, foxes, eagles, owls, or crows. Some even have the power to steal the faces of different people and can appear as someone you know or even appear as you. It has been said that if you accidentally make eye contact with a skinwalker, they can absorb themselves into your body essentially possessing and controlling you. Powerful skinwalkers even possess the ability to enchant the powder of corpses and turn it into a poison dust to be used on their victims. They can run incredibly long distances, 200 miles in one night. They like to hang around graveyards and have the ability to dig up graves incredibly fast. They also sometimes recruit other skinwalkers and those who have seen them describe them in different ways but the most common description is a hollowed out dog. If you want to kill a skinwalker, the only way you can is to call it by its real and human name. They can also cause sickness or disease in others, read minds and control others' thoughts or actions. They can control the creatures of the night and make them do their bidding. They can run faster than a car, jump as high as a cliff. They're extremely agile and hard to catch. But when they leave tracks in their animal form, the tracks are larger than a normal animal. It appears that the legend of the skinwalker originated in the Navajo tribe, but many other native peoples, such as the Apache, Hopi, and Ute, have their own version of the skinwalker. 
Sometimes a skinwalker started off as a person who had great spiritual or healing powers, but decided to use their powers for evil instead of good. They can be both male or female, but they're usually men. And they walk free amongst their people during the day and transform at night. In order to become a skinwalker, you have to kill a family member, usually a sibling. You will then be initiated into a secret society and be given the shape-shifting powers. Skinwalkers can choose whatever animal they want to turn into based on what their needs are at that moment. Do they want to fly? Do they need to run very fast? Do they need to be very strong? During the day, they will wear the skin of the animal that they transformed into, hence the name Skinwalker. And that is why the Navajos considered wearing the pelt of a predatory animal to be in poor taste. Their eyes in animal form are a dead giveaway that they are skinwalkers and not real animals. Their eyes look very human and turn bright red when a light is shown on them. But when they're in human form, their eyes look more animal than human, a sign of their constantly changing nature. The secret society of witches is usually led by an older member who has lived as a skinwalker for many years and has become very powerful. They meet in dark caves or out of the way places to plan their bad deeds, initiate new members, and perform their dark magic ceremonies. A skinwalker will make their presence known in many different ways. Oftentimes, they'll jump out into the road in front of a car in hopes of causing an accident. They'll peer into your windows at night. They'll knock on the walls or make scraping sounds on the roof. They kill out of greed, anger, envy, spite, revenge, which I feel is the reason most people kill, not just skinwalkers. But they must keep killing in order to survive as they sustain themselves on the life force of those they kill. In 1864, the Navajo people were chased off their land by the U.S. Army and forced to walk to Fort Sumner in New Mexico. For the next four years, the people suffered from drinking bad water, crops dying, and illness, which reduced their numbers greatly. During those four years, it was said that many of them turned into skinwalkers in order to escape their terrible circumstances. Those who didn't turn into skinwalkers lived in constant fear of the ones who had. They felt that the gods had abandoned them. The U.S. government, seeing what bad shape the tribe was in, allowed them to go back to their homeland, but allegedly, the skinwalkers who had infiltrated the tribe went with them. Even though things were better once they were back on their homeland, there was still the suspicion that the evil witches were walking amongst them, which led to the Navajo Witch Purge of 1878. Forty Navajo tribe members who were suspected of being witches were killed. Now it's said that the Navajo peoples, they don't like to talk about skinwalkers with outsiders. Some of them flat out refuse to do so, and allegedly it's because they're afraid of being targeted by these shape-shifting witches and warlocks. And now that we have some of the backstory of where skinwalkers came from and what they are or what they're believed to be, we're going to move on and go right to Skinwalker Ranch. Located on 480 acres of land in northeastern Utah, it borders the land of the Ute people who live on a reservation called the Unitaw and Ure Reservation, which covers 4.5 million acres of land and is the second largest reservation in the United States. The Ute people have allegedly claimed for many years that the ranch is on the path of the Skinwalker and they are forbidden from going near the property. The Ute people historically have had contact with the Navajo, both good contact and bad. At one point, they fought side by side against enemy tribes, but eventually the Ute tribe began kidnapping members of the Navajo tribe and selling them in New Mexico slave markets. The two tribes went way back, and it was actually the Ute tribe who had worked with the U.S. government to expel the Navajo from their land. And ever since then, they believed that the Navajo had cursed them and plagued their lands with the skinwalkers. The skinwalker's presence in the Unitaw Basin is believed to have began as far back as 15 generations. And although the skinwalkers do not live on the ranch, they prowl around it at night. They occupy an area called the Dark Canyon, which is located nearby. From what I can tell about the property known as Skinwalker Ranch, it was first inhabited in 1905 by the Myers family. At this time, it was a real rough kind of homestead place, just a few buildings, you know, a main house where the family would live. And later it was abandoned for a newer homestead that was still on the Skinwalker Ranch property. 
And obviously, just in case anybody wondered, at this point, it was not called Skinwalker Ranch. It would have been called Myers Ranch. Anytime a new family would occupy the ranch, it would go by the name of that family and then the word ranch. So it wasn't called Skinwalker Ranch. But just so we don't get confused about where we are and you guys don't think I'm talking about a whole new ranch, I'm gonna keep calling it Skinwalker Ranch for the purposes of being clear and communicative. In 1930, it was occupied by Kenneth and Edith Myers, and they lived there until 1987. During their time at the original homestead and the new homestead, both on Skinwalker Ranch, none of the Myers ever reported any strange occurrences or circumstances, although some of their neighbors did. But in order to really understand this story, we have to give a good idea of time and place. And this is Utah, and this is the desert of Utah, essentially. So there have always been a lot of UFO sightings and weird and mysterious things going on in Utah. I don't know why. Utah just has something about it that seems to attract these strange occurrences. In the 1950s, the Unitaw Basin area was host to several UFO sightings. In 1978, the Desiree News printed a story detailing several witnesses who had seen one floating over the village, about 10 miles away from the ranch. In 1964, a local businessman named Paul Peterson saw one as he was leaving a neighbor's home in Immigration Canyon. It was floating above him in the sky, and he watched as it drifted over and down until it hovered right above the driveway in front of him. Inside, he said he could see figures watching him, and they looked like normal people until they spoke to him telepathically, asking if he wanted to come with them. He answered them back by thinking his response, saying that he couldn't leave because he had a wife and children who loved and needed him. They told him, in his mind of course, that it was okay, and they floated back up and left. Another Utah resident, Ray Kelsey, reported that in the 1970s, he was working on an oil field when he and 250 other workers witnessed a UFO floating above an oil rig. That oil rig would later explode, and Kelsey and the others were told not to report the incident. And there are hundreds, thousands more stories just like these of Utah residents who genuinely believe that they've witnessed something extraterrestrial, something that's not of this world. A filmmaker local to Utah named Trent Harris said you can't throw a rock in Utah without hitting someone who's been abducted. And of course he means abducted by aliens or extraterrestrials, not abducted by other humans. Apparently this area of Utah, and especially the area of Skinwalker Ranch, is and has been a hotbed of paranormal activity for years. There are reports from the 1700s of Spanish explorers in search of the Spanish trail crossing over the land that would one day, many hundreds of years later, occupy Skinwalker Ranch. At night, while they sat by their campfires, they reported seeing strange lights in the sky. And remember, this was the 1700s, so these weren't searchlights or planes or helicopters. But like I said, Skinwalker Ranch wasn't always called Skinwalker Ranch, and when our story takes place and things start really getting crazy, Terry and Gwen Sherman lived there, and they called it Sherman Ranch. Terry and Gwen moved in with their children in 1994. The Myers had left the ranch in the 80s, and it remained vacant until the Shermans purchased it from them. They had moved from New Mexico after Terry had gained a reputation for being an accomplished breeder of black Angus cows. There are also a lot of reports that the Shermans were Mormons, so they left New Mexico and they came to Utah, specifically looking for a place that would be more accepting of their religion and their life. Lifestyle. They weren't polygamists, so when I say lifestyle, I don't want you to immediately jump from Mormon to polygamist, but they were not polygamists. They were just Mormons, and Utah obviously was a very Mormon friendly state. But when they bought the ranch, there was something that Terry Sherman found very strange. He was sold the property under some conditions, most specifically a condition that he wouldn't dig on the property before first requesting permission from the Myers, who had been the previous owners. And he thought about this for a while, thinking it was kind of strange that you could own a home, a ranch, and all this land, but you'd still have to seek permission from the previous owner before digging on your own land that you owned. But he was like, whatever, I got this place for a great price. My family needs a new start. I want to start breeding these cows, making money. This is going to be fine. I'm sure it's just some weird superstition or some family tradition. And he didn't think anything more about it. 
But upon walking through the house the first time after buying it, the family did find it strange that every single door in the home had deadbolts on the inside and the outside. Huge deadbolts. The windows were also bolted and had bars over them. And at both ends of the house, there was heavy chains attached to these steel rings that were embedded into the wall. Terry assumed that the previous owners must have had large guard dogs that they kept chained up there. That in combination with the heavy bolts on the doors and the windows being barred, he assumed maybe the previous owners were just really paranoid people. But the strange events started the first day the Shermans moved in. As they were unpacking boxes from their truck, the Shermans spotted a large animal in the distance moving their way. As it got closer, Terry and Gwen Sherman stopped what they were doing and watched as it ran towards them. They were trying to figure out what kind of animal it was. It was much too large to be a coyote, and wolves were not typically seen in that area of Utah. Terry's father, who had been helping them unpack the truck, also stopped what he was doing and walked over to join Gwen and Terry as they watched this animal lope towards them. And when the animal was about 50 feet away from them, it stopped and they were able to get a better look at it. Its gray fur was wet from running through the damp grass, but it was much bigger than your average wolf, almost three times bigger than any wolf they had ever seen. Terry's father wondered out loud if it was someone's pet. It seemed almost domesticated and unafraid of the people who stood staring at it. And as it walked closer, Terry began to worry about the herd of cows he'd already put safely in the corral. The cows seemed nervous and they moved away from the animal, all except for one calf who was curiously sticking its head through the bars trying to get a better look. This animal, what they thought was a wolf, walked right up to the family. And at closer range, they got an idea of how big this thing really was. Standing next to Terry's father, who was six feet tall, the wolf's head reached his chest. It smelled like wet dog and had shiny blue eyes that seemed almost human-like in appearance as it looked at them expectantly. Terry's father reached out his hand to pet this thing, still assuming it was somebody's pet and it was domesticated because it was acting very passive and nonviolent. But Terry, he felt like there was something off about this whole situation. Even as Gwen called the kids to jump down off the bed of the truck and come over and see this animal, Terry felt this growing anxiety in him. As the kids walked over to this huge wolf and started checking him out, the wolf made a sudden movement and sprang towards the corral where the baby calf was still sticking its head out trying to see what was going on. And he grabbed the baby calf's head in his mouth and started yanking as if trying to pull that little baby cow right through the bars of the corral. The family was stunned. The wolf had moved so fast, almost unrealistically fast and grabbed that calf. Even as the baby calf began crying in fear and pain, it took the family a couple of minutes to register what had happened. But as soon as they understood, Terry ran over and began kicking the side of the animal. But this animal acted like he wasn't even there, like nothing was happening. It was unfazed and it just kept trying to pull this little calf, this curious little calf, out of the corral. Terry's father grabbed a baseball bat and began hitting the back of this huge wolf. Once again, unfazed, acted as if Terry and his father weren't even there, weren't hitting him, weren't kicking him. Terry shouted to his son to get his Magnum revolver out of the truck. And once his son did and Terry had it in his hand, he fired two shots at this wolf right into the side of the animal. But the wolf didn't do anything. It didn't cry out in pain. It didn't stop trying to get that calf out of the corral. It didn't even bleed. So Terry Sherman fired another shot at the wolf and this time the wolf did react, but not in the way you would expect. He slowly released the calf from his mouth, turned and fixed the family in his icy blue stare. Terry knew that this wolf should be dead or at least very badly injured, but it seemed more annoyed with them than anything. Now Terry was concerned that the wolf would try to attack them, so he raised his gun one more time and shot a bullet straight into the wolf's heart. This shot did cause the wolf to back up about 30 feet, but it was still standing and still staring at them. As the wolf's gaze moved slowly from the family and back to that little calf in the corral, Terry whispered to his son to go get his 36 caliber shotgun from the house. This was a more powerful weapon and Terry knew, or at least he thought he knew, that no animal could survive a shot from this weapon. But when the shot rang out and hit its target, the wolf didn't fall to the ground, the wolf didn't die, it just stood there 
and kept staring at the family, staring at the man who had just shot it. So they're all obviously freaking out now, right? They know it's pretty much physically impossible for an animal, even an animal at that size, to survive that many shots from two different guns. Terry shot at it again, and this time, a chunk of its flesh fell off of the animal. But even after suffering an obvious injury, there was no yelp of pain from the animal. It didn't recoil and run away in fear. It stared at them for a moment, almost as if he wanted them to know, I'm okay, you may have gotten me, but I'm still standing. And then he turned and he slowly walked away back into the woods. So Terry knew that obviously this was a very dangerous predator. And as long as it roamed free, his livestock and his animals on the ranch would never be safe. He knew he had to go after this animal and kill it. He and his father ran after this wolf and they had it in their sights and they were able to follow its tracks in the wet ground. The wolf headed for a grove of Russian olive trees, but they were still right on its tail and still able to clearly follow its tracks. But once they got through the trees and back out into an open area, the tracks continued for a couple of yards, but then they stopped. They just vanished. There was no more tracks. They didn't go off in either direction. It didn't appear that the wolf had jumped and his tracks had picked up a little bit further along. There was just no tracks, as if the wolf had vanished, disappeared into thin air. The next week or so passed by without incident, so the family wrote off their really strange experience with this creature as a fluke. But then one day, after pulling onto their property after work, Gwen Sherman parked her car and she got out of her car to go close the gate. So you would see this ranch as a place that had a lot of property, but even once you got onto the property, you'd still have to drive quite a ways until you got to your homestead or your home. So Gwen Sherman would have gotten onto the property and passed through the gate that brought her onto Skinwalker Ranch, but she would have had to have gotten out of her car, gone to the gate and closed and locked it again so that no other person could just walk onto their property or drive onto their property. She closed the gate, she locked it. When she got back into her vehicle, she sensed some motion to her left. She quickly looked up and out her window and she saw an enormous wolf standing directly outside of her window. And when I say directly outside of her window, when he breathed, he left condensation on her window. It loomed over her. It had to bend down to look into her window. It was so tall. It wasn't the same animal they'd seen a week before, but it looked very similar with the same human-like blue eyes. Behind it, another darker animal lurked, watching. This animal looked less like a wolf and more like a dog, but it looked like a really strange dog. It was very big to be a dog, but its head seemed so much larger than it should have been for its body. Obviously feeling terrified and not knowing what to do, Gwen Sherman pushed the gas pedal and got the heck out of there. When Gwen and Terry went to the tribal office to complain about these ginormous wolves that were prowling on their property, they were told something that shocked them. They were told that wolves hadn't been seen in that area of Utah for over 70 years. They were told that they must be mistaken. They must be seeing coyotes. And the series of strange events that happened to the Shermans while they lived on this property would not end with massively large animals lurking on their property. They would see all sorts of strange animals that they didn't think even existed or definitely didn't exist in that area of the world. Tropical birds that would be sitting in trees, strange looking spiders that would be seen but then never seen again. One time they spotted what they thought was a hyena, but it had a fluffy tail like a fox and it was running around their horse corral and spooking the horses. Things would disappear and then reappear again in different places, in the most unlikely places. One day, Gwen went to take a shower and she locked the bathroom door behind her. And like most of us do, she took her towel and her hairbrush and put them on the sink so they'd be there for her when she got out. But when she got out of the shower, her towel and her hairbrush were completely gone. She thought to herself, I must not have brought these in. I must have imagined it. But later she found her hairbrush and her towel in the freezer. One day, she came home with bags of groceries, and as most of us do, she emptied the bags and put all the groceries away. She walked out of the kitchen for a few moments and came back in a couple minutes later, only to find that all the groceries she'd put away were now back in the bags. 
Gwen thought she was losing her mind. She thought she was going crazy. She thought she was having memory issues. She considered going to a doctor until one morning, Terry Sherman came into the kitchen where his wife and his kids were eating and he was mad. He was like, where'd my pole digger go? Who took my pole digger? He'd been using it and a pole digger is to basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's to dig holes that you would put poles into. So he was using it. He put it to the side, turned his back for a couple of minutes and when he turned back around to grab it, it had vanished. Obviously, Gwen and the Sherman kids were like, we've been in here eating breakfast the whole time. We don't know where your pole digger is. But several weeks later, that 70 pound pole digger was found in a tree. Two days later, Terry's pliers disappeared off of a fence he was fixing. The family would wake up to find strange holes dug around their property, and these were not little holes. These were massively big holes, but they looked almost as if they'd been cut out by a cookie cutter. Just very precisely, the hole's borders would be very clean and smooth, and there would have been several hundred pounds of dirt that these holes contained. Unseen forces whipped around the ranch. You couldn't see them, but you could feel them. A stranger came over to the ranch one day and told Terry that there was some spiritual forces at work on his ranch, and he requested Terry's permission to meditate on the ranch. Terry thought, this is kind of weird, but whatever. What isn't weird nowadays on this ranch? So he and his son brought this strange guy who wants to meditate on their ranch out to like the middle of a field, and they were like, okay, go ahead, meditate. And then they kind of walked away and watched. Most likely they were making fun of him together, like look at this guy meditating in the middle of our field. But as Terry and his son watched this man silently meditating, suddenly they all felt this force ripping through the meadow. Some unseen force was hurtling itself at this man who was seated and had his eyes closed. And just before it would have run right into him, it stopped short in front of him and roared in his face like a lion. Like I said, this was an invisible thing, but all three men who were present saw it, felt it, and heard it. And when I say saw it, it's because it was running through a meadow, so there was tall grass and things, and they could see the grass moving as if something was running through it. They just couldn't see what it was running through it. Obviously, the guy who was meditating was completely terrified, and he got off that ranch as soon as possible. The same thing would happen in the canals and the streams and things that were on the property. The family could often see things splashing in the water, as if there was someone walking through the water or running through the water, but they never actually saw what it was running through the water or splashing in the water. And there were these orbs that were their constant companions on the ranch. All different colors, different sizes, some benign, some not so much. There were small golf ball sized red orbs and baseball sized clear orbs with blue liquid inside of them that crackled and caused the house's electricity to react to it. The blue orbs were the worst. Whenever they were around, those who saw them would experience intense feelings of fear and anxiety. Even the family's dogs seemed to cower when the blue orbs hovered nearby. These orbs seemed to like teasing the dogs, flying close to them and then shooting away when the dogs tried to catch them. And the family, of course, had multiple sightings of unidentified flying objects. Terry's nephew was visiting for a few weeks and one evening at dusk, Terry, his nephew, and his son walked around the ranch as they normally did at night to check on the animals and make sure they were okay before going in for the night. Terry spotted the lights of a vehicle about a half a mile away, and he and the boys walked toward those lights to check it out. He had seen these lights on his property previously before, but he'd written it off as somebody who'd taken a wrong turn and gotten lost. But now as he kept seeing them, he thought it could be somebody who was trespassing on his property, most likely illegally hunting there. As they got closer, the vehicle seemed to switch directions and started moving away from them, which Terry found odd because it was completely dark now, so he didn't know how the vehicle or the people in the vehicle would have seen him. So they changed their pace and they sped up, but as they got closer and Terry kept his eyes on these lights, he noticed how smoothly the lights were moving. And that was very odd to him because the terrain that this vehicle would have been driving on was very bumpy and uneven. And you would expect to see the lights kind of bouncing around if they were attached to a vehicle that was driving over uneven ground. And even at 200 yards away, they could hear no engine sound. And if this was a car, they should have been close enough to it by now to hear the sound of this vehicle's engine. As he was considering this, the lights lifted off the ground a little bit before going back down. 
The three of them began running now towards the lights, seeing them lift and fall a couple of more times. Terry suddenly realized that the lights, which he had thought were attached to a car, were raising up and going back down in order to go over the fences that were on the property. And what kind of car can jump over fences? Eventually, the lights reached a wooded area that a car or a truck or any kind of vehicle wouldn't have been able to drive into. Terry was sure they were about to apprehend the intruders, but then the lights lifted higher and higher and higher until they were above the 50-foot trees. And as they looked up, they could see the outline of the object that was attached to the lights. It wasn't a car, it wasn't a truck, it wasn't an RV. It was a large rectangular object with lights on the front and on the back. And as they watched in amazement, it disappeared into the sky. And there was these strange portals that would open up and eventually Terry began to suspect that that was how the wolf, that original wolf they'd seen the first day they moved in, that was how he'd disappeared without leaving tracks. Terry believed that these spaces that would open and close again were doorways to a parallel universe or reality. Once at night, while Terry was sitting outside, he saw this circular object flying through the sky and on this circular object was a window. And through that window, Terry could see a slice of blue sky. The worst part for Terry and Gwen emotionally and financially was the loss of the animals that they sustained during their 18 months on the ranch. When they'd moved onto the ranch, they had 80 cows and 14 of those would die or vanish before they finally decided they had to leave. These cows were not just dying of natural causes. Terry would find them mutilated and destroyed. One cow had no signs of injury besides a hole bored through its eye. Others were found sliced up with their body parts or organs carefully removed. But in all these cases, no matter how gory it should have been, Terry Sherman found no traces of blood. The last straw for the Shermans came when those ominous blue orbs were taunting their dogs one night. This time, as these blue liquid-filled orbs teased the dogs, they led the family's pets further and further away from the house until they all disappeared into the trees. Terry called after them as they ran away, but they didn't listen, almost as if they were transfixed by something. And he could hear them yelping in the forest, but he was obviously too scared to go in after them. The next morning, he ventured into those woods to find out what had happened to his beloved pets. And all he could find were three circles of burned grass with what appeared to be the gooey remains, all that was left of the three dogs. Terry had talked to his neighbors and he told them he'd seen these strange wolf-like figures prowling on his land. One of Terry's neighbors told him he wasn't crazy. These things existed, they were out there, but no one would ever believe him. But the Shermans did decide to go public with what was happening to them at that ranch. They gave an interview to a local paper called the Desiree News, and they talked in detail about what they were experiencing, hoping someone local would have insight into what was going on. They published an article in June of 2006 titled Frequent Flyers, talking about the area's long history of strange happenings and the Shermans' struggle in a home that they had not even lived at for two years. In it, they explained how Terry has connected the many sightings of UFOs to what was happening with his cattle and how financially crippling it had become for him. These were not your average cows. Terry bred and raised award-winning certified Black Angus cattle that cost about $2,000 a pop. And he was bleeding money at this point as they disappeared or turned up dead. After the article published and as the news spread about the creepy circumstances happening on the ranch, people began showing up there to see for themselves. One woman walked right onto their property, walked right up to the homestead and told Terry that she was clinically insane. And as they were talking, a tree nearby began to shake violently. The woman pointed at the tree and told Terry fearfully that it was filled with legions of demons. The Shermans knew it was time to go. They couldn't be successful or profitable or happy living on this ranch. And frankly, they were scared to death. But because of the publicity that the story was gaining, one man did become aware of what was happening at that ranch. And he journeyed from Nevada to Utah on a private jet to make an offer on the ranch and its surrounding property. Now there's gonna be some strange players in the story from now on, and one of them is the man that purchased Skinwalker Ranch from the Shermans. His name was Robert Bigelow, and he was a businessman and a millionaire who had made his monies from the 60s to the 90s developing a chain of hotels and motels called Budget Inn Suites. 
He had been interested in space travel and paranormal events for his whole life, but a lot of people speculated that he eventually began to invest so much money into the research of these things when he lost both his son and his grandson in two separate tragedies. Maybe he had decided to spend his money on proving the existence of other realms, even in afterlife, that he could take comfort in knowing the loved ones in his life who had passed on were still existing in, and maybe one day he'd be able to communicate with them. And even if you want to say it's strange or crazy, Robert Bigelow was and is an extremely intelligent man who was not trying to be a part of anything that didn't have a scientific basis to it. In 1995, he founded the National Institute for Discovery Science, or NIDS for short. NIDS was a privately financed research institute that focused specifically on fringe science such as paranormal events and ufology. Now this may seem like a crazy man's passion project, but in fact he hired reputable scientists and former FBI agents. A retired army colonel named John B. Alexander, for example, was one of the most notable people who worked with NIDS at this time. He served for several years as the program manager for non-lethal defense at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And while he was there, he conducted briefings for the top level of U.S. government at the Department of National Security and the CIA. Bigelow offered the Shermans $200,000 for Skinwalker Ranch, and the Shermans agreed. However, Terry Sherman said he wanted to stay on as a foreman of the ranch. He and his family moved to another ranch about 25 miles away, but Bigelow was bringing in a team of scientists and his own animals for experiments. And the scientists and Bigelow himself, they had no idea how to care for animals, and Terry Sherman was really good at it. So Terry was going to be there to take care of the animals and run the ranch, but he also was now invested in seeing what was going on. He wanted to see this thing through and find out what the reason was that he and his family had been harassed and tortured for 18 months. Terry also suggested to the NIDS scientists that they should keep a low profile while coming onto the ranch. All of these strange events, such as the flying orbs and the unidentified flying objects, it was almost as if they could read your mind or know your intentions. If they knew you were trying to see them or trying to chase them, they would disappear. So if they really wanted to witness these strange events, they would have to come in and kind of keep their mission and their goals on the down low. However, NIDS didn't really do that, and I'm not even sure it would have been possible. They brought in a ton of scientific equipment to measure what was happening on the ranch. There wasn't really a way to keep a low profile when dozens of new people were coming onto the ranch and unloading all of these technological and scientific instruments from their cars and their vans. But the whole objective of the NIDS team was to recognize that there was a lot of allegations about what was happening in this place, and they wanted to see if these things could be measured and proven scientifically. They arrived in March of 1997, and on the very first day that the NIDS team came to Skinwalker Ranch, March 10th, the Shermans once again experienced a strange event. Terry and Gwen had just finished tagging an 84-pound calf, when they were finished doing that, they noticed some of the other animals were acting weird, so they walked over to check that out. 45 minutes later, they came back to check on the calf and found it dead, with its body cavity removed and its left ear that had been tagged cleanly cut off. Once again, there was not one drop of blood, and this is reported and verified by the NIDS scientists. There was also another event that happened while Terry and Gwen were still there that the NIDS scientists were able to document. There were some bulls that were in this, you know, gated area, and they went missing. Terry and Gwen drove by the padlock they were usually kept in, and they weren't there. So they stopped, and they got out, and they kind of searched around trying to find where the bulls had gone. Finally, Terry went over to this trailer. So it's like a trailer that you would put on the back of a car if you want to bring animals from place to place. And he didn't hear anything coming from inside the trailer, so he thought it was a long shot, but he decided to open it up. And inside, he saw all of the bulls that were missing just crammed into this trailer. They were standing there. They weren't making a sound. They weren't moving. It was like they were entranced. So Terry shouted out to Gwen to tell her that he'd found them. And as soon as the bulls heard his voice, they woke up. Like they were waking up from being hypnotized and they began freaking out because they found themselves all crammed together in this very small space. They began just going ham and kicking at the door and butting each other and trying to get out. Once Terry and Gwen were able to calm the bulls down and get them out of the trailer and back into the fenced off area, they looked at each other and they were like, what's going on here? And that's when they discovered that the fence that was surrounding the bulls or where the bulls should have been before they were shoved into the trailer it was magnetized, so you could put something metal on this metal fence 
and it would hold to it as if it was a magnet. The NID scientist came and checked out this fence and they confirmed, in fact, that it was magnetized and it stayed that way for about 48 hours and then the magnetization completely left the fence. NIDS made some changes to the property, wanting to study what was going on there without the interference of the general public who had now become interested in Skinwalker Ranch. They placed gates on the main road, allegedly illegally because the main road wasn't part of their property, but they really wanted to prevent anybody from driving anywhere close to their land. They also fenced off the entire area and placed no trespassing signs all over to discourage anyone from entering the ranch on foot. Throughout the next couple of months, the NIDS team would witness many strange things. The people staying at the ranch reported large animals running around with yellow eyes who would leave little to no tracks and who were never injured or killed when shot at. They saw lights in the sky in what appeared to be flying crafts. They had put video cameras all over the place with lines running into the ground and back to the control center in the house. Many people visually saw orbs of light flying around at night, but the video equipment, which was equipped with night vision, never captured it. In fact, one day, their cameras were vandalized by whatever was prowling around on the ranch. There was this one pole with three different video cameras positioned on it, all looking in different directions at different angles. Back at the house, whoever was monitoring those cameras witnessed the cameras go dead, one by one, all three of them. They sent a team of people out to where the cameras were to check it out, and those people discovered that the duct tape that had been surrounding the wires on the pole had been meticulously removed. So keep in mind, there's the cameras on the pole, and then they're gonna have duct tape wrapped all the way around the pole to the bottom of the ground where the wires are going and then going underground and back to the house. So there's a lot of duct tape covering these wires and covering the pole. They want to obviously protect the wires from falling off or being blown around by the wind, and they also want to protect the wires from the elements like rain or wind or snow or cold. There wasn't just like one tiny piece of duct tape holding the wire in place. This pole was wrapped around with duct tape, and somehow, in a very short time, someone or something had come and completely removed the duct tape, not ripped it off. There wasn't pieces of duct tape left. They'd somehow managed to take the duct tape off as if it had never been there. The wires on these three cameras had been cleanly cut. And what's more is not one piece of this duct tape was ever found or recovered. And they looked all over the ranch to see if somebody had grabbed the duct tape and then dropped it when they were running away. Maybe they could kind of guess what direction that person had gone into, but they never found another trace of that duct tape. So they said, okay, no big deal. We've got cameras all over this place. We've got cameras facing this pole where these other cameras were on. So we for sure are gonna be able to see who did this. They checked the camera footage, they went to the time when the cameras had stopped working, which was about 8.30 p.m., and they saw nothing, absolutely nothing. All they saw were the three red lights that were on the cameras, the lights that would suggest that they were on and recording, just completely blink out at the same time at 8.30 p.m. On the camera, they could also see some of the ranch animals kind of standing around the pole that the, the three cameras had been attached to, and they made no sign of seeing anybody. Normally, if a person walked up to you know, a herd of cattle, the cattle are gonna be like, you know, what's, who is that, what's going on? They're kind of gonna react, but these, these cows made no reaction, made no sign that something or someone else was there. But someone or something had clearly been there because the duct tape had been removed. The wires were cut. Another time, one of the scientists who had been staying on the ranch claimed that one of those clear orbs with the blue liquid inside floated near him and spoke to him telepathically and told him, we're watching you. The team reported hundreds of incidences and anomalies that they encountered while staying on the ranch. And they handled these obviously in a scientific way. That's what they were there to do. And these weren't UFO hunters. These weren't guys who walked around wearing, you know, hats made out of tinfoil. These were legitimate, respected scientists who went to school for years to learn how to handle things in a scientific way. What they really needed were these events to repeat themselves because that's how you study an event and that's how you figure out what's going on and what's causing it. This way you can find out what's similar about this instance that wasn't similar about this instance or what seems to be the common denominator when this thing keeps happening. Is it raining when this happens? Is it nighttime when this happens? But the really tough thing that these scientists faced while they were staying on Skinwalker Ranch 
was that no two events were ever exactly the same. They were all seeing the same things, things that should have been impossible, and it frustrated these people because they could find no scientific reason for any of it. In 1999, NIDS set up a hotline encouraging those who lived in the area around Skinwalker Ranch or in you know the nearby town of Desiree to come forward and let them know some of the things they'd experienced in their lives. They got 5,000 calls reporting incidences such as cattle mutilation, shapeshifters, ball lightning, Bigfoot sightings, crop circles, various lights and orbs, and unidentified aircrafts. In 2004, NIDS wrapped up at the ranch as these occurrences were happening less and less as the time went on until they weren't happening at all. Some believe that the presence of the scientists on the ranch caused whatever was living there to move on to another area where they weren't being monitored and watched. But that was not the end of the interest in that piece of land. In 2016, Robert Bigelow sold Skinwalker Ranch to a company called Adamantium Holdings for $4.5 million. Who is Adamantium Holdings and why did they want this ranch? Well, first of all, if you're an X-Men fan like I am, you'll know that adamantium is the fictitious material that makes up Wolverine's claws and bones. So it's definitely sketchy and a little suspicious and creepy right off the bat that this company that bought Skinwalker Ranch in 2016 is called Adamantium Holdings and that the name of their company is based on a fictitious substance. And it appears that the person who owns this corporation wants to remain anonymous, which has caused a lot of speculation online as to who he could be. He appeared in the documentary Hunt for the Skinwalker, but you can only hear his voice, which is disguised, and see his hands. Some people believe he could be Richard Branson or Elon Musk, even the British pop singer Robbie Williams. Apparently Robbie Williams has gotten his name thrown into this mix because of his friendship with Robert Bigelow. But at this time, there's really no evidence to support or deny who this person could be. What we do know is that in July of 2016, a representative for the company named Thomas Winterton went to a Unitaw County Commission meeting and asked to have Hicken Ranch Road, which was a public road that went through Skinwalker Ranch, vacated and made into a private road due to the rampant trespassing issues they had been having. The place now is locked up like a fort. And there's no way to really get on that property, which obviously adds to the mystery of the whole thing. In 2018, this man, Thomas Winterton, made an online public statement in response to the rampant speculation that had been going on on the internet. Here is what he said. As I am under an NDA, I am very limited in what I can say, but in light of several of the past posts, I will just set the record straight. First and obvious, the new owner or owners does not want to be identified. The new owner or owners is, are very successful and intelligent. He, she, they have gone to great lengths and expense to keep their identity private. There have been layers added and precautions taken to ensure privacy. Because no public dollars have been used in purchasing or maintaining the ranch, it really is none of the public's business who owns it. I understand the curiosity, but that does not supersede a private entity's right to remain private. The owners has, have, set up Adamantium, hired a law firm to manage it, hired a real estate management company to oversee it, and have done everything through third-party contractors. Even the manager of the ranch was chosen and hired by the real estate management company. When I submit an invoice for my consulting, I submit it to the real estate management company. So pretty much this Thomas Winterton person. He's not even saying whether this owner is a man or a woman, even though it was clearly a man in the Skinwalker documentary, but he's going at great lengths to make it as obscure as possible. So you could really never guess who it was. And he's being very specific and insistent when he's saying they want their privacy. They don't want you to know who they are or why they bought the ranch or what they're doing there. And they have a right to that. So I did some research into Adamantium Holdings. Of course I did. On the company's main page, if you look in the About section, it claims that the Adamantium Group is a multidisciplinary company focused on architecture and real estate and supervised by a man named Manolo Rueda. It goes on to say that this man, the CEO, has spent the last 20 years working in luxury, but for the last three years, he's been focused on pro-health construction, researching and studying energies, connections in physics, mathematics, geometry, cosmology, quantum mechanics, biology, 
chemistry, as well as anthropology and ancient civilizations. It says, quote, on the website, Rueda's works are focused on a fundamental energy and geometry of space that connects us all, from the quantum and molecular scale to cosmological objects in the universe. In Rueda's theory, gravity and electromagnetism are unified, something predicted by the inventor Nikola Tesla and confirmed by the Sidney D. Agavlio 2016 Intervallic Theory of Physics and Quantum. So that's weird, right? If Rueda is the one in charge and he is the man whose voice we heard in the documentary and whose hands we saw in the documentary, what does he want with Skinwalker Ranch? If for the past three years he's been studying things like mathematics, physics, energies, cosmology, quantum mechanics, chemistry, it seems strange. Something else I found when looking into the Adamantium Group was a 2017 article in the Guyana Times titled Adamantium Holdings Bids for Government Contracts. This article claims that the company was in the running to secure millions from the Public Securities Ministry. It goes on to say that Adamantium Holdings was recently named Top Gold Producer of 2015. So it looks like they have their fingers in all sorts of pies all over the world. Additionally, Adamantium Holdings filed for a copyright on the name Skinwalker Ranch shortly after purchasing the property. Okay, so while I was researching this video, I came across some new information about the trademark. Now, in this thing I saw online, it says that the trademark was abandoned on 10-7-2019, so just this month. It says the last applicant slash owner of this trademark was Adamantium Real Estate LLC in Salt Lake City, Utah. Now, why they decided to abandon this trademark, I'm not sure, but it is new information and I wanted you guys to have it. But what goes on there, we have no idea. It's locked up tight. But according to the mysterious owner, they are finding out things there that are incredibly important. Which leads many people to believe that Skinwalker Ranch is somehow connected to the U.S. government, either before the Shermans moved in there or after when Bigelow purchased it. The website skinwalkerranch.org lays out the ranch's connection to government and military agencies and personnel pretty well. Some theorize that a corporation called Science Application International Corporation used the ranch and the Unitaw Basin to test their non-lethal exotic advanced military technology. SAIC has been described as a secret, elusive organization that is a contractor of the U.S. military, and they create technology for the defense, space, federal, civilian, and intelligence markets. The Department of Defense has also been heavily connected to Robert Bigelow and Skinwalker Ranch. In 2017, the New York Times posted a piece calling out the Pentagon for having a department exclusively dedicated to following up on UFO sightings and the like. Now, the government has claimed to have pulled funding from this project already. However, insiders say that the work still goes on within the government. A man named Luis Elizondo ran that program and resigned from the Department of Defense after 22 years of working there. The program was called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, which operated on the fifth floor of the Pentagon. Harry Reid, a former Democratic senator from Nevada, also plays a part in this story. He had been a constant supporter of continued study for UFO phenomena. Earlier this year, he gave an interview to KLAS in Las Vegas, suggesting that he had inside knowledge that countries such as China and Russia are spending money to figure out how UFOs work and to build their own. He also spoke about an American program called Advanced Aerospace Weapons Systems Application Program that investigated these sightings by military personnel, such as the Tic Tac UFO, captured on camera by a fighter jet off the coast of California in 2004. He alluded to what so many have suspected, that the United States government has and may still be looking into the activities on Skinwalker Ranch. At one point, this program awarded a $10 million contract to Robert Bigelow's company, Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies. And Bigelow is currently working with the United States government to build some sort of inflatable spacecraft. And just a few minutes ago, we spoke about AATIP, the agency that was working out of the Pentagon under the direction of Luis Elizondo, who was a former intelligence officer who retired after 22 years of service. This agency was brought into existence by Harry Reid, using taxpayer money while he was still a senator. So this clearly tells us that the idea of UFOs and forces being at work that aren't 
readily explainable, these beliefs aren't just held by people who wear tin hats. The government has been looking into it for decades and takes it seriously enough to have created specific departments to investigate these things solely. And Robert Bigelow, for some reason, has gotten a lot of hate on the internet and people just call him out for all sorts of things, even though he really hasn't done anything wrong. He's been accused of only being interested in searching for UFOs or trying to find out what these unexplainable things are, specifically so he can find a UFO and then reverse engineer its technology and build his own UFO. And so what if that's what he's trying to do? Who cares? I would like to build my own UFO. Wouldn't you like to build your own UFO? Wouldn't you like to go and space travel safely? That sounds awesome to me. Why does that make him a bad guy? But these theories are similar to Bob Lazar's claims in 1989 that he'd been hired by the government to study the nine alien spacecrafts they had hidden away at Area 51 with the specific intent to figure out how they worked and how they were built so that the government could create their own. And who is connected to Bob Lazar but George Knapp, the very same journalist who was buddies with Robert Bigelow and who was allowed exclusively to be on Skinwalker Ranch and report on what was going on there. George Knapp also co-wrote the book, Hunt for the Skinwalker, and he was part of the documentary based on that book by the same name. Everything seems connected, but nothing makes sense. Those who have experience with the ranch and those who have lived in the area for a long time believe the ranch and the entire Unitaw Basin is a thin place. Thin places are places of energy where the veil between two worlds is thin and if someone knows how, they can travel from one world to the next. We see this possibility in so many stories that come from Skinwalker Ranch. Take for example the scientific experiment with the cameras that were on the pole that got tampered with. Remember, it was 8.30 p.m. and at this time it was still light out at 8.30 p.m. So they were able to see pretty clearly on the camera. So imagine there's wires on this pole. They go from the top of the pole all the way down to the bottom of the pole. They go into the ground. These wires are surrounded by PVC pipe. The PVC pipe is surrounded by duct tape. And those cameras had been there without incident for about a year. So that duct tape that was wrapped around the PVC pipe that was surrounding the wire it had been weathered, it had been rained on, it was hot, it was cold. It wasn't a new duct tape that you could easily peel off, yet somebody managed to do that, and very quickly. So obviously they, they looked at the video, they went to 8.30, they see nothing besides the cameras going dead. They don't even see the duct tape coming off. They just see the cows grazing in the field who notice nothing. They don't have great resolution at this time, so they send it off to the NIDS laboratory in Nevada to have it um, kind of you know looked at more and maybe up the contrast, up the brightness, try to see things a little bit more clearly. And it was from this enhancement that they were able to see the red lights on the cameras go out, but nothing else. Colonel John Alexander gave an interview where he spoke about this event and he explained that the cameras were on an intervolometer, which is commonly used when videotaping something for long amounts of time for a time lapse. Instead of constantly running, the camera captures a frame once every second or three frames per second. So since something clearly removed the duct tape, wires, and PVC pipe, this would have had to have happened within a second. Therefore, it's safe to assume, since this was witnessed by several people and legitimate people like scientists and military personnel, if this happened, it would have had to have been an invisible, impossibly fast thing, or someone or something who was able to control time enough to stop and start it and to appear and disappear through space and time within the blink of an eye. Many believe that this is proof that Skinwalker Ranch is a thin place where it is easy for beings to navigate in and out without being seen. And you have to understand, even though we have all these crazy occurrences, the NIDS people were on that ranch for seven years. And most of the time, nothing was happening. They'd go months and months without any incident at all. And every time they saw or experienced something, that same thing would never happen twice to the same person. As scientists, it was their mission and their job to quantify these things so they could be studied, but they were unable to do that. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle once said, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. So I guess what we kind of have to accept is that these things are actually happening on Skinwalker Ranch or every single person involved is lying. The Shermans, Robert Bigelow, George Knapp, Colonel John Alexander, the entire NIDS team, the new owner of the ranch, whoever he is. All of these people would have to be in on it together, communicating regularly together to keep their story straight, and pushing this lie on the general public for years. 
And that just seems to me so improbable. And that's why I struggled with this research when I was doing it, because there's so many people involved. And a lot of the scientists, we don't know who they are because of the fact that they were legitimate scientists and they wanted to go on and do work in the scientific field after they left Skinwalker Ranch. So they kind of didn't want to be connected with Skinwalker Ranch for fear of being blacklisted by the legitimate scientific community. So a lot of them, we don't know who they are, but a lot of them, we do know who they are. Ex-government employees, military personnel, scientists who have PhDs and studies under their belts. Why would all of these people lie? Why would they make it up? Why would they be in on such a grand scheme? And I mean, you'll find people online on YouTube who go to Skinwalker Ranch or like hang out outside of the bounds and they'll be like, oh, we're here, you know, we're digging in the dirt because apparently if you dig in the dirt around that area, it will bring the Skinwalkers out because they don't like that. Or we're, you know, lighting a flame and then they hold up like a lighter or something because that's supposed to draw them out too. But once again, you have to remember, and Terry Sherman told the NID scientists the same thing, it seems as if these presences on the ranch, they don't really want to be noticed. They don't really want you to see them or catch them in the act. They're just there living their lives and you happen to be there too, but they're not trying to be seen by you, except maybe for those blue orbs who were messing with the dogs all the time. But in general, the stuff going on there, they didn't want to be seen. So if you're there specifically trying to catch them in the act for one night, you're probably not going to see anything. The NID scientists were there for seven years and there'd be months that went by without them seeing anything or anything happening. And I do have to say that I am a person and you may judge me, don't come for me. I believe in multiple universes. I believe in parallel worlds. I think it's such a cool theory. It's such a cool thing to think about. And the fact that there may be multiple versions of yourself living in multiple universes, just making different decisions and ending up in different places. It's so cool and interesting. And I love that. So is it possible that Skinwalker Ranch and the Unita Basin may be in this thin place where the veil between the two worlds is incredibly thin and you can kind of see each other sometimes, but you're not really living in the same world. Because you have to think about it, if we have multiple universes, currently we are in the same space, I guess, or presence as the other multiple universes and our other selves or our other people in different universes are moving along with their lives around us. They're just doing their own thing, but we can't see them and they can't see us. Is it also possible that they're seeing UFOs and creatures or people from other planets? I definitely also believe that there's life out there in the universe. I don't believe that there's life in our own universe, but you have to think about how many different universes are out there. And to logically know what lays outside of the bounds of our universe and to still think that we as humans on this earth are the only living things in, in the entire multitude of universes that surround us, it's kind of self-centered. We can't be the only ones. There have to be people out there or creatures out there or other forms of societies or other forms of people. I don't know. It's so cool to think about and definitely very possible. The fact that the government had agencies created specifically to study UFOs and specifically military personnel sightings of UFOs because the military are constantly coming across UFOs and weird things that they can't explain. They're flying in their planes all the time. They're in the middle of the ocean at night on their, on their big Navy ships. You know, the military are always running in to these kinds of things. And there was an agency created specifically to gather their accounts and their sightings and study them. But now the government wants to kind of backpedal a little bit and be like, no, that's not, that's not what it was for. And we pulled all the funding from that agency. Like it's not happening anymore, but we have it on good authority that it is still happening. So I don't know. Let me know what you guys think about that. There was so much more that happened and so much more to the story that I couldn't cover in this video. So I highly suggest if you're interested, go to skinwalkerranch.org, read or download on Audible the book Hunt for the Skinwalker. The documentary Hunt for the Skinwalker is also really good. I made Adam watch it with me and I don't know if I've ever told you guys this before, but Adam is like the opposite of me. He's not superstitious. He doesn't believe in ghosts. He doesn't believe in energies or spirits or anything like that. He's very, very logical. 
And he watched the documentary with me and he literally left it saying, this is, it's crazy. Like I kind of feel that I have to believe this because the only logical explanation is that everybody else was lying. And I said, exactly, that's the same conclusion that I came to. So we kind of were on the same page with that. So that documentary is really good, but be careful. If you go searching online, be prepared to get lost into a rabbit hole that seemingly never ends. There's so much online about it and so many people who are really interested and obsessed with kind of getting to the bottom of this. But keep an open mind because like I said, if there's one thing we can be certain of, there's something else out there. We know that there are many other universes outside of our own universe. And we also know that time travel is a scientific concept that we may not be technologically advanced at this point to accomplish, but one day with the right technology, we will be able to achieve that. So if we know that, which we do, we'd have to assume that those in the future, our future selves, our future societies have already figured out how to use time travel. And they may be traveling through time to visit us. That could be why alien spacecrafts are always described by so many different people as looking different. Some people say they're round, some people say they're square, some people say they're rectangular. They could just be different models of spacecraft from different points in the future. Just like today, our cars all look different based on what model or what year they were made in. So if you don't wanna believe in aliens and that makes you uncomfortable, you do have to take that into account, the fact that we will someday achieve time travel. That means somebody already has in the future and they could be coming back to visit us, but maybe they could be coming back to visit us from all different times. Like maybe one person's coming back from the year 4,000 and another person's coming back from the year uh, 5,001. So they have two different models of spacecraft. It's just so interesting and cool and creepy to think about and your mind will get blown by all of the stuff that you'll find on the internet about this. And, and it, a lot of it's legit. So let me know what you guys think. I definitely encourage you to read the book at least or listen to it on Audible or, or watch the documentary. It's perfect for the season. It will definitely freak you out, but it'll also leave you thinking about yourself, the world, the universe, your place here. It was so much fun researching this case and a lot of the cases I did for Halloween, I went in expecting what I'd always heard about them, like the LaLaurie Mansion and H.H. H. Holmes, which I'm doing for, for another Halloween video. And I found out that a lot of stuff about those stories was enhanced for um, embellishment to make it more dramatic and make it a better story to tell. When I went into this case, it's almost like the opposite happened. I, I expected to find out that it was all fake and that it was completely, you know, a joke. Maybe some online people just got together and, and made a hoax. But I found that I was having a hard time figuring out what could possibly be a hoax here or how could they even do this hoax or how could so many people be in it and what's in it for them? The new owner of Skinwalker Ranch says in the documentary that there's dangerous things going on in that ranch today that his um, workers or the people, his employees who are staying on the ranch and whatever they're doing, who knows what they're doing, we don't know, but whatever they're doing on there, they've been staying there and some of them have gotten sick. He said some of them almost died. It's almost as if he's suggesting that they're being attacked by something or someone. Hopefully one day Adamantium Holdings will feel generous and, and let us know what the heck's going on. But either way, let me know what you guys think in the comments. This was a crazy one. Stay kind and stay beautiful and stay spooky. I'll see you next time. Bye.